Today we're going to talk about love, but we're going to take it a little bit deeper, and we're going to talk about proactive love. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Jesus went ahead and died for us anyway. Now, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 goes a little bit deeper, and it says that Jesus was the lamb slain before the world was even framed. So what that lets me know is that the Lord knew we were going to fall even before he created us. And God already, because of his love for his creation, put a plan in place to express his love. There's no greater love that a man can display to another than to lay down his life for another. And our Heavenly Father put a plan in place that his only begotten son was going to come and die for us, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But the lesson we learn in this is that God was proactive in his love to us. Us sinning didn't take God by surprise. Jesus wasn't an afterthought. Jesus came because the Father loved us before we even knew who he was. And we're going to talk about that today. Father, I pray for this message. I pray that the Holy Spirit speak to us and let this message really resonate within us on a practical level. That as we learn the kind of love that you have, that proactive love that you displayed to us, that we are going to display that to others that we are going to take the initiative to love and to forgive and to be there for others, even when people don't deserve it. Your word says, Lord, that we display to the world that we are yours because of our love one for another. And so I pray for this word. Speak to us. Anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. And Father, anoint me as I deliver this message today. And let us go to another level concerning this message on the topic of love. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a quote that I want to put up here, and I want to put this up here before we really dig deep into this. Our behavior, not our intentions, reveals the condition of our heart. How many times have we found ourselves making the statement, um, oh, I, I love the Lord, but we're not living a life that is in keeping with his commands. Or, I, I, you know, I really love my husband, I love my wife, I, I, love, my, or I, I love brother so-and-so. I mean, I know I've went and gossiped about them and, and said a bunch of things that destroyed their character. But no, I really love them. I believe a lot of times our intentions, they might be well. But the Bible says in Matthew 7, 20, by our fruit we will be known. And so when it comes to this topic of love, we got to dig deep today, church family, this world needs a church that is proactive in loving others and is showing the world that God's love is different than the world's kind of love. And our behavior, not our intentions, reveals the condition of our heart. How can we then be proactive with the love of God? What does that even mean? I think that's a question each of us should ask ourselves on a daily basis. In this fast-paced world where we are inundated with news and information instantly and constantly, I believe that we've become reactive. As soon as we see an event or we see a headline, we're quick to react and tell the world where we stand or how we feel about it as a Christian or as a church. And in our reaction, we're acting out of the moment. When you look at the life of Jesus, it was obvious that his love was proactive. He was the one that took the initiative to reach out to people. Obviously, his death on the cross was the greatest act of proactive world, love that the world has ever seen. Because in our opening text in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. What that tells me is God didn't wait for humanity to finally come around. He took the initiative and died when we didn't deserve it. When Jesus would go into the homes of sinners and he would eat with them, he was being proactive. Zacchaeus, I'm not going to wait until you, you finally come to me. I see you. I see your faith. I'm coming to your house today. Example after example after example through the gospel shows that Jesus, like the woman at the well, she wasn't going to seek Jesus out, but the Bible says he went out of his way to go seek her out. 
So that tells me that Jesus was proactive in showing love to his own creation. When we look at our life, we need to ask ourselves, am I reacting to a situation or am I being proactive? 1 Corinthians 13, 2. And the Message Bible says, if I speak God's word with power, revealing all of his mysteries and make everything plain as day, and if I have faith that can say to a mountain, jump and it jumps, but I do not have love, this is what it says. I am, did we read that right there? Is that what it says? Nothing. So what can we do to show whether it's the love of God? Where can we build a bridge today instead of construct a wall? Who in our life needs us to listen to their problems? Who is in our path that needs a hand that will lift them up instead of push them down? Each of us in here today has the responsibility by God himself to love one another as he commands. Each of us have the capacity to do it. Even if you don't think you can, you can. And remember what Jesus told us. John 13, 35. The world will know you because of your love one for another. I want to put John chapter 14 up here, and I want to show a couple of verses in John chapter 14 because I think by doing this, it's going to help us understand what being proactive or what being responsive to situations uh, teaches us about this kind of love. So to help understand how to be proactive in our love toward others, we need to see how our love toward the Lord is supposed to be proactive. Or do we love him or do we seek him or obey him just because we want to get something from him. We've probably all been guilty of this, haven't we? We really don't seek the Lord. We don't really obey his commands the way we ought to. And then we find, our, find ourselves in a life crisis. And man, we are at church that next, we're at Sunday school that next Sunday. We got the kids with us and we got ready. We got up early. Why? Because something presented itself to me. And what's happening is I'm reacting to the problem. I'm responding to the issue. But Jesus said this in John chapter 14, verse 15. He said, if you love me, then you keep my commands. Now, the word love here really opens us up a little bit as to what the Lord's really saying here. Because when you look it up in the Greek, it means a personal attachment, a fondness to deliberately attach as a matter of the heart rather than the head. So that lets me know that I'm not going to base my love on the Lord on circumstances, on my emotions, or what my mind tells me, or because God's doing some good things in my life, then I'll be faithful to the Lord. Being proactive in our love to the Lord shows that we love him and shows that our obedience to him, that's what Jesus says, it shows our obedience to him is not because we want to get something from God. It's showing the Lord, I love you, and just because I love you, I'm going to obey your word. Now, the word obey even opens this up a little bit more because the, the word obey means to maintain or to actively obey. What that means is that all of us are going to face a roadblock. All of us are going to face our flesh coming and wanting us to do something contrary to the word of the Lord. But my obedience will be maintained. Oh, I'm going to mess up because none of us are perfect. And so we will sin. Scripture says if we do sin, we've got an advocate with the Father. Not if we sin, but when we sin. This is an attitude that really hasn't learned that lesson yet. It's, Lord, you are the insurance after the fire's already started. It's, Lord, I'm just going to run to you when I have a need. I'm going to pray when I've got a problem. It's only when I've got a need in my life or I need direction that I'm going to truly seek you. And Jesus says, that's not the kind of love I'm talking about. Your obedience to me, your service to me, your worship to me is based on the fact that you love me, not in your head, but in your heart. And you are proactive in that love. See, the Lord is saying that the kind of relationship that I want you to have with me is the kind of relationship that I have with you. That because Jesus was proactive in his love to us, once that love's revealed to us, and the Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts and the Holy Ghost truly reveals that to us, then we need to be proactive in our love to the Lord. Whether he answers a prayer for me or not, I'm not praying because I have a need from the Lord. I'm not coming to church because I need to get bailed out of a bad situation. I'm here simply because I love Jesus. Later on in verse 21, Jesus says, He that has my commands and keeps, obeys, or maintains them, this is the one that loves me. 
This is the one that loves me. Oh, I, I love Jesus, but I'm, I'm, you know, getting drunk every weekend. I don't know. Jesus says, if you got my commands and you keep them, this is the one that loves me. And so scripture says that we demonstrate our love to the Lord by our obedience. Are y'all getting this? I know this is deep. I know this is kind of tough, but we got to learn this. And, and, and I have to lay the groundwork before we can move to that next level and see how we can display that kind of love to other people. Here's a biggie, Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. <laughs> Let's put this up here. This is, we're going we're gonna to go to the next level with this. Okay, we've talked about our love to the Lord. That's a whole other lesson. Jesus said, if you love those that love you, what reward? What, King James says, what reward have you? This is basically what the Lord is saying. So what? Do not even the publicans do that? This is what the Lord is saying. The world knows how to love those that love them. You know, the scratch my back, scratch your back philosophy. I'm not going to ask forgiveness from brother so-and-so until he comes and asks me for forgiveness first. I'm not going to give anything that I have to somebody that has a need until somebody gives to me first. How about this one? I ain't calling them. They can call me first. Listen, some of you in here are looking at me like you don't think I know what I'm talking about. Every single one of you in here have faced a situation where you've either done it or at least your flesh has told you, I ain't doing anything. I'm not taking, they could take the first step. Well, see, being proactive in love is the opposite of that. Being proactive in love says, I take the first step. I take the initiative. I'm the bigger person. Because Jesus says that is a worldly kind of love to where our love is only given based on what someone does for me. And Jesus says, that's the world's kind of love. So what? Even publicans, even sinners can do that. Well, let's break it down and let's put this up here. And let's look at the distinction between proactive love and a reactionary love. I apologize if you can't see that. I, I made this graphic and then when I put it on in here, um, just the lighting just didn't. But let's look at this. Proactive defined means to take the initiative, serving to prepare for, intervene in, or control an expected occurrence or situation. One's ability to prepare for something or to anticipate. Being proactive, listen to me, in something isn't a lack of faith. Being proactive is wisdom. Being proactive is looking a step ahead. My wife and I have had this discussion because of her years in the military and what she did with, with security. And she told me, she said, uh, even, when, even when she goes into theaters or restaurants or out anywhere in public, she is looking. She's, I mean, she has already scanned the room. She knows where the exit is. She's looking to see if there's any sketchy characters that are coming walking in. I mean, she knows how to look for that stuff because she was trained in that in the military. She's being proactive. Now, what the Lord wants us to do is to be proactive. Now, how can I be proactive? Every single day when you pray, you need to pray this prayer. Lord, give me the grace that whoever offends me today, give me the strength that if someone does something wrong to me today, your love is going to counteract whatever it is that's done. See, y'all are getting quiet in here today. This is the, we're not praying those prayers. The Lord revealed this to me when I was putting this message together. The reason why we are not able to display the love of God the way we're supposed to is because we're not being proactive. We are not anticipating. We're not preparing our heart. The problem is, is because as human beings, we are reactive. And let's look at the definition of reactive. This is, this is probably how most of us respond to what happens in life. It's responsive. It's reactive. To reply or react to a response that results from an outside action. I was convicted this week and my wife convicted me this week. We pray with Kalen every day. Before Kalen leaves to go to school, we pray with him. And we put the responsibility on his shoulders. We're trying to teach him, you need to pray before you leave to go to school. And what happens is we pray with Kayla, and usually what we hear is, oh, Lord, you know, and I got to go, bye. I got to catch the bus. 
And then Wednesday happened. Wednesday happened. 17 students in Florida didn't make a home that day. Now, I'm not saying they didn't pray, and I'm not saying none of them were Christians. I'm not saying that. But what happened was a crisis caused us to reevaluate how we pray with Kalen before he goes to school. And it convicted me. And it let me know that sometimes we are asleep spiritually, not prepared for whatever life comes, comes our way with. Am I making any sense here? We are reactionary. Normally, we, we respond. If somebody lashes out, we lash back. Jesus said, it's not eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth anymore. You're not supposed to respond that way. You prepare yourself that when you're persecuted, you know how to act. When someone says something about you, you know how to respond. When a crisis comes your way, you've already prepared yourself. He taught us that because he said, this is how you prepare yourself. You hear the word, you do the word, and what you're doing is you're putting a foundation into your life that when the winds come and beat violently against you, you've laid a foundation strong enough that you're not going to respond and be too weak. You've already prepared yourself. You've sowed the word in your heart, and so when something comes and squeezes you, what's going to come out? If you sow the word in and you get squeezed, what's going to come out? If you're sowing prayer and the presence of the Lord on the inside of you at a greater degree, when you get squeezed, what's going to come out? That's being proactive. The problem is, as we go through problems and then we respond, and then God by his, this is what's amazing, God by his grace, he'll answer some of those prayers. He'll reveal himself. And then when things, oh, wow, things calm down a little bit, and then we ease off. That's not what real love's all about. You see, love's a verb. It's supposed to be active. It's supposed to be proactive. It's supposed to be constantly engaged. And for our love to stay strong and for it to stay vibrant, for it to be living and growing, it has to be active at all times. It has to be proactive. It cannot be responsive. And so how can we do this? I'm glad you asked. Lesson one. So this is what I did. I kind of showed you a couple of steps down the road and now we're going to take a step back now we're going to learn how to make sure our hearts are prepared to be proactive this is the lesson in lesson one you got to guard your heart Matthew chapter 24 verse 12 says because iniquity or lawlessness abounds the love of many is going to wax cold Iniquity means wickedness or unrighteousness or transgressions of God's law. Wax cold, listen, means a reduction in temperature or to chill. This is the problem. When we're not spending time in the presence of the Lord and allowing the fire, because God's a consuming fire, and the fire of his presence to keep our hearts pliable and moldable like wax. That's why Jesus used wax as an example. Because when wax stays warm, the wax stays pliable it's it's like liquid but the moment you blow that candle out what happens the wax gets hard so jesus is saying that love the love of people the love of many a matter of fact many now he's referring to the last days here in matthew chapter 24 i believe we're living in the last days and, and I believe that a lot of the stuff that we're seeing happen in society, and I'm not saying it's all this way, but I'm saying a lot of these things. Joe and I had this conversation this week. I mean, we grew up in the 70s and 80s. Now, when I went to school, man, people were in the parking lot of the school with shotguns in the back of their truck on gun racks. And they weren't going into, the, there was no security, there was nobody, that, they weren't going into school and shooting people out. Now, I know this is for another debate, but this is what I'm saying. A generation ago, you didn't see these things. Why all of a sudden? Why all of a sudden in this generation, these last 30 years, are we, are we starting to see this? Because I believe the, the, the love of the world is out there in the iniquity of the world. And that's what Matthew 24 talks about. Because iniquity abounds. Because sin abounds. Video games and movies and music. You can't glorify that stuff in a video game or in a movie or even in music and not think it's not going to affect our children. And what's happened is the love of our society has waxed cold. And this is where it really gets deep. This is the problem. It's infiltrated the church. The church doesn't know how to love anymore. 
We've allowed society to affect the way we love people. And Jesus says this is exactly what's going to happen. Iniquity is going to be everywhere. Sin is going to be everywhere. Every, every, you're not even going to know what real love is all about. You're going to listen to the world's definition of what love is, but not what God's definition of love is. And he says because of this, the love of many is going to wax cold. It's a disturbing trend. It's something that we ought to do something about. We are allowing the sin of the world to cause our hearts to grow cold. Now, the interesting thing is that Jesus uses the term waxing cold. So what that means is that initially it wasn't cold, but it was waxed cold. Waxed says that there's a process. So what that says is every time we get hurt, we put another brick on the wall. Every time we get offended, we put another brick on the wall. Every time something happens between us and somebody in church, instead of being proactive about it and saying, I'm dealing with this before it even happens. I'm not going to let Satan get an advantage. And that's what Paul said. Paul said, listen, you cannot let Satan get an advantage over you. And what he's talking about is you've got to be proactive. You can't let Satan get in under the radar and bring all this damage to your life and to your emotions and to your heart and you don't even know about it until it's too late. It's a drip by drip by drip by drip. And when you blow that candle out, I mean, it takes a few minutes for it to grow cold, right? Before it gets hard. Jesus used that example to explain to us this is what happens on the inside of our heart the moment we stop being proactive but responsive. And so what happens when we need to show the love of God, when we need to respond the way God wants us to, our hearts are hard and we just can't do it. We want to. That's why I put that quote up at the beginning of the message. My intention, I, 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 I intended to do the right thing, but you cannot override the condition of your heart. I, I, I want to love this person. I, 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 I want to love this, my enemy. I want to love my spouse. I want to love that leader in the church that offended. I, I wanted to. In my mind, I wanted to, but in my heart, I couldn't because your heart is waxed cold. Am I making any sense in here today? And that's why Scripture tells us we've got to guard our heart. It's a dangerous place to be. It's a heart that isn't sensitive anymore. It's a heart that is now putting self-interest, self-gain, self-motivation, self-pleasure, self-pursuits above what God commands us to do. This is a heart that is now starting to get offended a whole lot easier than it used to. This is a heart that's now finding faults in people. This is an amazing thing that, that I've noticed. When, when we truly love someone, even if we see a fault, we will not let it affect the way we love somebody. What happens when we get to this place is we go looking. It's like we go on a discovery with a shovel. We get jealous or we get offended or we're envious. And so what have it, I'm going to find a fault with him. There's no way somebody blessed like that has come by that honestly. Or there, I, I, don't, I am sick of seeing the blessings that, that they just keep showing everybody. And, and what happens is, is because the, the heart is cold, I'm going to find so I will find something wrong. Finding fault in the scripture says that we'll do that. We'll judge quickly, or we're not as passionate about the kingdom anymore. We're not as passionate about the church. We're not as passionate about servanthood or serving others. How many times have we got hurt in church and we've told ourselves, no more? I've given myself to that church. I have sowed, I've paid my tithes faithfully. I've given myself to the lives of other people and all that happens to me is I get hurt and I get hurt and I get abused and I get talked about. I'm not doing it anymore. You show me a scripture that says that despite it, that happening to you in your life, you have the justification to no longer love the way God tells you to love. I want to know where that scripture is. The thing about it is, is it will not penetrate deep within your heart and take root if you're proactive. 
Jeremy knows about this because Jeremy's a farmer, and Jeremy knows that before planting season even starts, you've got to be proactive, don't you, Jeremy? You've got to go out. You've got to till the ground. You've got to prepare. The, I mean, before you even see the harvest, you've got to tend to the ground first. You tend to the soil. And then even when the seed is in the ground, you've got to take care of the seed even in the ground. You're proactive. That's what we've got to do. We've got to be proactive. Am I making any sense in here? Can I just get an amen? I want to know you're listening. Okay. These are all side effects of a heart that's waxed cold. And it's all the result of a world that we've allowed into our hearts now. And our definition of love is the world's definition, and it isn't God's. The dangerous part of this is, is also within its very definition of wax cold. This didn't happen overnight. This is why you've got to guard your heart. I'm going to park here and I'll get to the next point. How can I explain this? When we get hurt, we get bruised. I'm not, listen, nowhere in this am I excusing wrongs done to us by someone. But what I am saying is if we don't respond the right way, then the wrong that was done will multiply itself where we can deal with it immediately because we were proactive. Dealt with the moment it happened. But this is what happens. We're not praying the way we need to. We're not in the word the way we need to be. We're not spending time in the fire, presence of the fire of God. And so the wax of our heart is starting to get a little cold. And it might not happen next week or next month, but eventually, eventually, mark it down, eventually. Situation's going to happen. You get hurt at work, a family member says something, somebody in church didn't shake your hand, you weren't asked to do something when you wanted to do it, you fill in the blank. And what happens is your heart is not at a place to where it can withstand that. And so you hold on to it. Hebrews says, don't let a root of bitterness in your heart because it will defile you. So what happens is we've let something, listen, that should have never taken root because our heart wasn't ready. We let it take root and we're being reactionary instead of proactive, but it's too late. And so what happens is in the middle of the night, the enemy sends these demons to us and he starts adding to the hurt that happened. And he starts lying about things and he starts speaking to your mind. You think it's the Holy Spirit or you think it's discernment or you think it's you know, wisdom, and all it is is the enemy finding you at a vulnerable place to where he is watering that seed. You go into church and you see that individual, and all of a sudden this thought crosses your mind. They don't love you. They're against you. They talked about you. When you walked in the room, they turned the other way because they were talking about you. Am I making any sense? Anybody ever heard that voice before? We'll go on social media and we're like, I know they're talking about me in that post. Even if they were, you cannot respond the way the world responds. And so what happens is it takes time without realizing that all these things are going on within your heart. It happens in marriages. It happens in friendships. It happens in our relationship with the church. Things are going on under the surface, and we don't even realize it. And then one day, bam, it reveals itself. That's how it happens. It's subtle. It's not just allowing sin to harden a heart, but it's also a failure to rightly handle hurtful situations the right way. Remember, it's not just sin that's influencing us through the world that's around us, through TV and movies and the Internet. It's not forgiving quickly or maybe getting hurt when we really shouldn't be getting hurt or expecting more from others than they can produce. Allowing gossip to influence how we feel about an individual or expecting others to love us first before we choose to love them. All of these things, you can fill in the blank. After time, it will affect your heart. And Scripture says that out of the heart, all of the issues of life come forth from it. And it will spill over into everything that you do. Hebrews 12, 15 is where that's located. It talks about that that root of offense that gets down, 
that root of bitterness. It's unfulfilled revenge. The next step, when we don't deal with it, all of a sudden now we're creating scenarios of how we're going to get back. It's unfulfilled revenge. Now, I know this is, I mean, this is terror church, guys, so nobody in here has ever thought in their mind on how they're going to get back at somebody. I understand that. Because we all got halos and we're so holy and we've never done that. I want you to hear me. You can be a Christian that comes to church. You sit in the pew. You're active in church duties and maybe even you're in leadership. But deep down within your heart, it is growing colder and colder every day. And as long as you don't let the Holy Spirit heal you and set you free, your heart is waxing cold. 1 John 4.20 says, if someone says, I love God, but they hate their brother, you are a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can you love God who you have not seen? Lesson two. I'm going to hurry. Lesson two. This really brings things into perspective. Love is the greatest command. Now, I think we've heard, I th listen, this is what I think. I think we have heard that so much in church that the meaning of it goes right over our head. I want you to think about this. Those of you that are in church today, you're obeying the command of forsaking not your assembly together. Those of you that tithe in the, in the, in the offering today, bring your, bring your first fruits, bring your tithe to the store. You've obeyed, you've obeyed that. Those of you that were engaged in worship, I'm going to come to the house of the Lord and make a joyful noise. You've done a, man, I obey those. Th this is the thing about it. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13, in giving the definition of love, it says you can even give your body to be burned for the cause of Christ. But if you don't have love, it's nothing. 1 Corinthians 13 says you can take everything you have and sell it and take all those proceeds and give it to the poor. But if you don't have love, it's nothing. Let that sink in in you today. Love is the absolute greatest command. I can think of a lot of things, a lot of awesome things that, that I do or you do. I mean, I, I look at my life, I'm like, Lord, I preach every week and I pour into lives and I sing and I, and I pray for people and, 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 and it doesn't matter. None of that matters. I could pastor a church of 10,000 and 1,000 could come to Christ that day. But according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if I don't love people, if I'm put in a situation and I don't know how to react with love, and I don't, I'm not proactive in loving, Scripture says it doesn't matter. Love's the greatest command. Am I making any sense here? This is what gets me, man. People go out into the community and they look holy and they dress holy. They want to go out because I'm, I'm holy. I mean, listen, listen. You can, listen, women, you can go out and not wear makeup and wear skirts and not wear jeans, but you go to your restaurant and, teach your, and, and, and treat your waitress like she's beneath you and can't love people and scream at the, the teenager in the drive through who's just trying to make some money. Well, you look holy, and you went to church that day, and you sounded holy, all that was was being a Pharisee and religious. And we can go out into this community, guys, come on, and we can go on about how we love Jesus and, and, and you know, I, it doesn't, none of that matters if we don't love because love's the greatest command. Now, <laughs> some Christians think they've arrived when they got the Holy Ghost. I'm speaking in tongues. I got the Holy Ghost. Well, 1 Corinthians 13 also says I can speak with the tongues of men and the tongues of angels, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. That sound of that angelic language is, is like going over and bashing that symbol. Well, man, I got a position in the church. I got a title. Listen, I got four certificates on my wall in my office. MIP, ordained, um, exhorter, and a bishop. Man, I've I'm a bishop. So what? If I don't have love, I'm nothing. 
But what, what's happened in the church is we think we've arrived because we can speak in tongues. We think we've arrived if we got a position in the church. We think we've arrived if we've got a title. But the Bible says is love is the greatest of every command that has been given by Jesus. Well, how can I do that? How can I obey that? Let's put this up here. This is how we do it. We got to see, we got to forgive, and we got to react as God does. How does God see people? This is how God sees people. Scripture tells us that when Jesus saw people as sheep with no shepherd, he wept. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, Jesus, now, he did not, he's not condoning sin. Don't get me wrong. But Jesus realizes that all of humanity is fallen and broken, born in sin. And so the way that we love, the way God wants us to love is we got to learn how to see people the way God sees people. Are you with me? How does God see people? How does God react to people? Well, if we were God, if I was God, there wouldn't be anybody in church today. Because all of you would have been struck by lightning. <laughs> hey, I'm being human in here today. Lord, strike him with lightning. I mean, how does God react? Now, Lord, don't take him out. Just, just let the car get totaled. That's all I'm asking for. Just let the car, don't take him out. Just get a few bumps. Of, that'll teach him. How does God forgive people? How, well, how do we forgive people? Well, I'm not forgiving you until... Until you forgive me. My forgiveness is based on merit. My forgiveness is based on what you. No, no, no. That's not how God forgives us. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says in Scripture. In Isaiah 118. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will now make them white as snow. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. The moment someone has wronged us and says, forgive me, it's got to be washed clean. That's how God sees people. That's how God reacts to people. And that's how God forgives people. And if we can learn that, listen, this message is a whole lot deeper than the, the short amount of time I'm teaching and preaching it today. But these are some things that we've got to learn. Remember, when Jesus came, he presented God to the world in such a different way than they ever knew God before. Jesus presented God as a loving father, not just a righteous judge. Is he a righteous judge? Yes. But he also presented God as a loving father, something that mankind really didn't understand. Lesson three, let's close with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I want to read this. We're just going to read it, verses 1 through 13. The third lesson is this. What's God's definition of love? Well, what is God's definition? Let's look at this. First Corinthians chapter 13. Let's look at this and let's just go through this. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and I don't have charity or love, I have just a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Let's just keep reading this, Andre, all the way to verse 13. And though I have prophecy and I can understand all mysteries and I have all knowledge, and though I have all faith and I can remove mountains and if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Verse 3. Are you seeing this? is God's definition. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and I don't have love, it doesn't profit me anything. Here's the definition, verse 4. Love suffers long. It means love is patient. Let's stop it here. Love is patient. That's God's. Is anybody in here struggle with patience? I do. Listen, we don't need any... Listen, we don't need any reaction from family members or loved ones or friends or spouses. Love's patient. It means it suffers long. It means it endures pain. It suffers. It endures trouble without complaining. That's the definition. It endures trouble without complaining. Anybody here struggle with complaining? Then the Bible says that you're not suffering long, and that's God's definition. So the moment you find yourself complaining about a hardship or complaining about something somebody did to you, then you're not lining up with what God says true love is. I'm not condemning you. I'm trying to let the truth make you free today. It means to calmly tolerate, to delay, <laughs> to be diligent, and to show calm endurance. Hallelujah. Philippians 2.14 says, do all things without murmuring and, and, and disputes. James 5.9 says, if you've got a grudge against another, lest you're condemned, 
The judge stands at the door. You better deal with that grudge. Woo, wow. James 3, 5, and 6 about a complaining tongue says the tongue is a little member that boasts great things, but it is like a fire that a small fire starts a forest fire. That's how the tongue is. And so when I look at the word patient and suffering long, oh boy, Jesus help me. Love is also kind. It means it's sympathetic, it's gentle, it's benevolent, it is active in doing good. These are the Greek definitions. It is active in doing good. I'm kind to people, not just because they're kind to me. I'm kind because that's my spirit. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be kind one to another, and be tenderhearted. Forgive one another. And as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you, you forgive others. That's the word, Ephesians 4.32. That's what God says. Be tenderhearted. You're noticing the heart, the heart, the heart, the heart. Don't let it wax cold. Be tender. Love has no envy. Well, I, I could preach a whole message on it, a whole series on this one. This is what it means. Discontent or ill will over another's advantages. It must be nice. Another's possessions. A desire for something that, something that another person has. Y you know that most envious people are not rich people. Or have those that have things. It's those that don't. We like to point our finger and say, that rich man must be, really? Because if you're envying what they got, you're just as guilty. Love doesn't vaunt itself. It doesn't parade itself. That's what it means. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't have a showy display. Jesus said, if your right hand does something, don't, don't let your left hand know. If you show love to someone, you don't need to advertise it, get a billboard, post it everywhere. If you did it, do it. Don't worry about parading itself around. It is a showy display. It, this is what it means. When you go deeper, it means to be pretend. To not be real with who we really are. It's not puffed up. The word puffed up means it's not arrogant. Arrogant means full of pride to be haughty or to be high-minded. I can't be full of pride. I can't, I can't be haughty. It doesn't behave rudely. I could park it here for a while. Because some of us, let's all be honest, some of us are just rude. Come on. Okay. Who can agree with me? Some of us are just rude. We're rude. We are rude to people. We're rude to the world. We're rude to our waitress or waiter. We are rude to, how, how about this one? And, 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 I'm, and I've learned this, and Jovi and I try to do this, try to do this with Kaylin, and, and, and I know we've done it with our, we're going to try to teach our grandkids. Thank you. Please excuse me. You get a gift, write a thank you card. Let someone, when someone says thank you, say you're welcome. Lost in today's society. Scripture says when you love, you won't be rude. You won't have an entitlement attitude that says I deserved that. Rude means crude and rough and discourteous. It doesn't seek its own. That means it's selfish. Selfish means to insist on one's own rights and demanding special precedence. Overly concerned with one's own interest with a little concern for others. Love is not easily provoked. Listen, some of us, it doesn't even take a prodding. Some of us, the wind blows the wrong way and we're provoked. I just got up in a bad mood today. I just got up on the wrong side of the bed. I didn't have my coffee this morning. Come on. That's what happens. That's what happens. It's not provoked. Provoked means irritable, touchy, rough, hostile, no grace under pressure or short-tempered. It thinks no evil. This means that we do not keep an account of wrongs done. We can erase resentment and we can forgive by erasing those bad thoughts. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. This is what it means. I don't find satisfaction in the shortcoming of another person, even to the point where I will spread an evil or negative report to other people, even if what I see was true. I don't rejoice in iniquity. But rather, it rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. I will lovely tolerate the mistake of another. It bears. It, it doesn't accuse. It, it lovingly tolerates. It, 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 it defends and it holds out. I will give the benefit of the doubt. That's basically what bearing all things means. 
until I get information. I'm not going to respond. I'm, I give the benefit of the doubt. It bears all things. It believes all things. That doesn't mean you, mean you open up the false doctrine or lies. What that means is, is I, I look only for the best in others. I hold the good virtues. I give credit to others uh, with good intentions, and I'm not suspicious, always looking over my back. I believe all things. I hope all things. I never give up on someone. I endure all things. That means I can persevere and remain loyal until the end. And this is what gets me. And let's put that final graphic up here. This is how God ends 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love never fails. Never. Now listen, I get it. On Wednesdays we're learning and killing kryptonite. This love tells the truth. How many times have you ever made that statement? I'm telling you the truth because I love you. Make sure it qualifies in 1 Corinthians 13. I could speak the truth, but I do it in love. I don't do it to hurt or to tear down. I do it to help expose something to someone that needs deliverance. Amen? Love never fails. Say that with me. Love never fails fails. Verse 13, I'll close with this and we'll end. It says, now abides faith, hope, and love. You got those three, but the greatest of these is love. Stand with me. Mm -hmm.